I am Norman M. Miller. I am the I work for the Workers Educational Association, the, mostly in local history. Now, in the matter of empl employment and uh, the possible dangers in here and such a thing, building and shipbuilding had something in common that you're often working a beating the level of the ground. There is therefore the chance uh, you taking a far or something far on top of you. Now my grandfather was a mason and when he was working in one project on the scaffolding, uh, I think this was the brigade that carries Great Southern Road along the D side railway line. But the scaffolding collapsed and he was injured. Fortunately, nay seriously, but enough to have him off work for a while. He was a, in a good position because his son, my father, was working at the time. I was therefore a wage coming into the house. My grandfather didn't have to get back to work before he was really fit to do it, which is nay aye the case. The, no, I shouldn't have deemed that, should I? Um, uh, the, the other trouble uh, it, that beset the masons was because building material is hard, when you cut it, it gives rise to a lot of dust. And if this dust, you breathe it in, obviously, if the dust is settling in your lungs, it prevents your lungs doing their job, which is to tuck in oxygen in. Expel carbon dioxide, and it uh, is a condition called pneumoconiosis. And there was a really serious form of it, silicosis, which was a thing that troubled the folk. It worked in granite. Far as I came, my grandfather, certainly at the end of his working life, was looking after himself, and he did not particularly suffer from that. Although it is worth pointing out that today, in the modern world, in South America, there are all silver mines which, after being worked for centuries, you have to go far into the hillside to find the ore. And of course they extend the galleries with explosives, which then create a great lot of dust. And you kind of get a lot of it because you're in a confined space. And the folk that work there, seldom live beyond 40. And much as folk complain about the health and safety culture in our society, but you didn't hear health and safety culture, men die at 40 because of their conditions of work. Now, in shipbuilding in the days of riveting, one of the big problems was the noise which is made by using one bit of metal to hit another bit of metal while surrounded by a metal structure. And riveters and others working with them frequently had problems with their hearing. You would find the riveters, especially the other men, they would be sitting or standing right aside in another and they'd be shouting because it was the only one that could be heard. But when they introduced the automatic, the mechanical riveting hammers, there was a worse problem. Was the hammer was vibrating all the time and the dirling in your fingers and in fact all the way up your arm destroyed the effectiveness of the nerves and even the blood vessels. You got a condition kind of fat finger sometimes. And you had a a lot of these men had a shark in their hands and they, they couldn't uh, control it completely. I've even heard that uh, it was a riveter, and maybe more than one, but one that I have actually heard of, is that riveters would wear a gravet at work. That's a clue that, you, that ties on your neck and stops the sweat rather than doing it inside your shirt. And this man would tie his gravet onto his wrist Put it over his neck, hug the other hand, hug the other end with his left hand, and he would then be able to raise a cup or a glass up to his lip 
without scaling the liquid because he had the use of bathed hands to steady it. Well, Van Welden Tinella is the dominant wire joining bits of ship together. The problem was then largely a damage to your in because the welding flame is very, either gas or electric, it's very bright. And obviously they wore goggles to protect their in. But despite this, sometimes little, tiny little bits of very hot metal flew off the job and sometimes it did get in your in. And because they were very smart and because they were obviously hard, it was difficult to get them out. So in that case, uh, there was a medical charity called the Eye Institute. Uh, it was on King Street in Aberdeen. They do every shipbuilding to uh, every industrial too, and certainly every shipbuilding too would have been one of these. The Eye Institute was housed in, but it had been built as a house. It was the house of John Smith, Aberdeen's first city architect. And you went there when you had problems with your in, and if it was a little bit of steel, which usually for welders, that's what it was, uh, they could tuck it out with a magnet. Now, as it would happen, this this building was no longer required when it come when the National Health Service was set up in 1947. The, the health service took over, the hospital took over responsibility for looking after your in as well as just about nothing else. And the building was blocked by the Bangalore Marcus Society, which is the trade union that organised welders, riveters, platers, the steel workers in the yards. And it was their social club, <coughs> which of course was to a considerable extent a drinking club. And I was speaking to a small group of folk, I put me this one of these. Yeah, odd little, you know, circumstances to arise sometimes. Welders went to this place to get fires to you to the rain, and later welders went there uh, for an, an evening of entertainment. And in the group I was speaking to, and then there was a welder's wife, and she immediately said, Aye, welders still come out of there, nay able to see. Well, that was uh, that was a problem which, uh, you know, the problem you're in, uh, something it faced uh, welders particularly. Um, but when a ship was being built, it had to be held up, and it was held up during construction on props, which were huge blocks of wood. And clearly, when it came time to launch the ship, you had to get rid of the props. Now this, uh, I can't, Charlie, he was a hudder up and he was in the yard at Lewis's and they were getting ready for a launch ship, ship rest for knocking the props out and any of them come out quicker than they were expecting and it fell and hit Charlie and knocked him out. So he sent for a stretcher to tuck him out of the yard and he said as an old stretcher it had been out in the rain, it got wet, it got dried, it was as hard as anything. He said, Best as well of team out in any of the plates they used for building the ships. And he was lying there, gone through the, the yard, passing out in a consciousness. And he looked up and he saw the lads he was passing through, they were tucking their caps off. And he was lying there, and I thought, I must be dead. And I, I think, this is heaven. And he looked up and there was a ship in the stocks. And he thought, ah, they've got yards up here and now. Neither building nor ship building were particularly dangerous places to work. Although, obviously, there were quite serious accidents in bathe, even fatalities in bathe. But the really dangerous thing, certainly the occupation that was dominant in Aberdeen, was deep sea fishing and folk were really quite frequently lost in that. I had heard that 
And if you're a coal miner, you were about twice as likely as the average worker to die as a result of accident at work. But as a deep sea fisherman, it was about ten times. Um, the conditions at sea in a relatively small ship, the while you were pulling something up through the sea over the side of the ship, and the tall net, which is dragged along the seabed by the action of the trawler, it has to be held open, and this is deemed by otter boards, which are huge bobs of wood, and you have to raise them over into the uh, the deck of the ship, and there's a danger of being hit by that, or in fact by only part of the net. And there's a danger for the winch, which is a DNS work, which sometimes folk got their, you got your sleeve caught in that, it could tear your arm off. And of course, there was a danger of being washed overboard. There was really a high level of fatality in, in deep sea fishing. In fact, there had been a high level of fatality in the, all our open boat fishing of the previous century, essentially. Or sometimes, uh, the open boat fishermen, they went out at night and they came back in the morning with such fish as they had caught. And sometimes there was a storm arose and there would be a lot of men lost. There was a village in the northeast, seat in the muckles, and nearly all the adult men were lost in one storm. It just ceased to exist because there was nobody to do the, uh, you know, the work which was the basic work of that place. It's a place called Muckles now, but it's actually near the, it's near the same place. It's a similar place, similar situation, but it's near the same place. And one of the, one of the really unpleasant things that it seems to me a fairly unpleasant thing that happened in deep sea fishing is at one time uh, the men to avoid paying for the food that they were eating which if they were eating if they were eating meat and pieces and that they had to pay for that uh, but once you have got fish aboard uh, they cut the fish open and they took out the fish livers and fried them and uh, only thing mere greasy and fried fish liver is just hard to imagine. But between the wars, there was a change there because folks started producing cod liver oil. And, and there were two firms in Aberdeen that produced cod liver oil. Uh, one of which was a local firm, Isaac Spencer. And they actually had a little boaty that come round the trawlers in the harbour collecting the contents of the liver jar. I mind my old man, if I was a welder, telling me that he had the most unpleasant bits of welding he ever had to do was welding a liver jar. As it cost the, the grease for the livers, you didn't get rid of it all. And you put a flame on it, you've got the smoke of, of all oil for the liver. And you're standing there welding it, you kind of get a walk of your 